Okay, I hope you've had a chance to come up with some possible explanation as to why that's happening. Um, later on in this presentation, you will see a probable answer, okay? All right, worms. There are a lot of worms in the water, in the ocean, in the bays, in the lagoons, in the estuaries in all those places that we've talked about so far, and we will continue to talk about, particularly in the next unit and beyond, but, but you don't see them very often. You don't see these worms um, anywhere because they hide. They're very good at hiding. They're tiny, that's why. So many species are parasitic. Most of them are slender, small, they have pointed ends, these nematodes. You're talking about nematodes now, in particular, not just all worms, okay? So we're starting off with worms because we're moving up in the classification taxonomy of you know, more complexly organized creatures. And the first type of worm we're talking about is nematodes. So, again, this is what a nematode looks like. There are terrestrial nematodes. There are nematodes that live in the soil. There are parasitic nematodes, parasitic to plants as well as uh, animals. All right? Um, and they have this interesting hydrostatic skeleton that... Um, has a layer of muscles that enables them to wiggle around and move. So I'm not going to spend too much time on any one particular uh, phylum of these organisms, but segmented worms are a pretty big one. So segmented worms, are, they're called annelids. Earthworms are a terrestrial uh, example, okay? And these are the first level of, of organisms um, that have a true sea loam, other than the cnidarians that we discussed, like um, a sea anemone, okay? They have a, 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 a body cavity called a sea loam. Um, and they have these repeating segments, like a segmented worms, segments, repeating segments. Polychaetes are the first one. Polychaete worms um, are extremely varied throughout the marine environment. I grew up with these worms. That didn't sound right. I didn't have worms when I was a child. No, when we would go fishing on the south shore of Long Island, um, we would oftentimes go to the bait store and buy a, a box, it looked like a, a Chinese food to-go box. You know, those white ones with the little metal handles. Um, it looked like that, but inside was a brown algae with pneumatocysts, we called pop grass, um, that kept it moist. And all in between the pop grass were these worms about this long, and they looked like this. They're, and we called them blood worms for two reasons. One, when you cut them, they were red, and when you cut them, red blood came out. Two, they had these spiky mouth parts, these, these biters, <laughs> that would uh, draw blood from you. They would pinch and, and hurt very bad. So we used them as bait, and the fish loved them. So, but the polychaetes are just like earthworms, but they're not round, they're more flattened a little bit, okay? And they have these CT. Their, their parapodia are almost like um, little feet. Para means almost, pod means feet. So they're almost like feet, okay? And they extend down the entire length of the body and they use them for going through sand and going over the surface of the sand and stuff like that. And this is a, a blown up, ver you know, really close to the different parts and they have these hair-like extensions. They don't have hair, of course, because they're not mammals. 
Um, and this is, a, this is a blood worm on a mud flat. Here's a blood worm that I was talking about before. And fish like flounders love those guys. So here, yeah, here's the bitey parts in some of them. Um, and they have eyes that are pretty much all together, they're light sensing eyes. They don't see like our eyes do. We don't get to that, to the end of, the, end of these notes. An organism that's advanced enough to have eyes similar to human or mammal, mammalian or bird eyes, or you know, vertebrate eyes, I should say. So this is just a scientific illustration, very basic. And you can see how many different parts there are to these critters' heads, these polyheat heads. They have a closed circulatory system with blood vessels. So again, you're going to start seeing more similarities to mammals like us as we go up in the taxonomic levels. Okay? They have gills, so they don't they, they don't absorb like a nematode would their oxygen through their skin. They have gills now. Okay? And so the gills, just like fish, absorb oxygen through the water. Um, and they're extensions of the body wall. They have many thin walled blood vessels called capillaries, so just like in any other gills. Um, <clears throat> and here's a polychaete from South Carolina. <clears throat> There's about 6,000 species of polychaetes. Many of them are carnivores, hence the, the bitey parts, okay? And those that feed on organic particles are called uh, deposit feeders. They're like detritivores, but more specific, okay? And this is a lugworm. We have these right here in Florida. They can be quite long, but when they contract, like when they're trying to get away, they can shrink up to like short and fat. I know it looks kind of gross, and yeah, I guess they are in a way, but um, they're very important marine uh, species, all of these guys are. Many of them live in tubes made of mucus protein, bits of seaweed, all cemented together um, with um, like mucus, okay? And you have seen them. You, if you've ever been to the beach, you've seen them. When the tide washes the sand back and exposes um, little holes in the sand, if you dig down or if you go out in further into the water where there's waves aren't crashing and the water is about you know four or five feet deep, if you dive down you can, and look at the bottom, you can see the, these little tubes everywhere. And um, you may often wonder, what the heck is that? Well, it's this. Tubes that are made of mucus, protein, and other things all cemented together. Different species cement different things together to make their homes. So here's some Pacific Ocean tube worms. This is called a feather duster worm. Um, it has this tube here and it sends out its like leg-like extensions to, to capture small prey in the water, like a feather duster. Other kinds of worms are called peanut worms. They live in muddy bottoms. They burrow um, in rocks, hide in shells. They have um, branching tentacles that can be withdrawn, causing the worm to be compacted and look like a peanut. That's why it has its name. This is some of the tentacles that come out of the end to feed peanut worms. Um, I don't even know how to pronounce that. <laughs> um, Ecurins? I don't know. It doesn't really matter. Just know that these weird things exist. Okay, there's about 100 species. All of them are marine. I have never personally seen one in real life, um, but they are deposit feeders, and yeah, they have this really weird um, shape to them. This is called an innkeeper worm. So you, you don't very you, you very rarely see these these creatures um, because uh, they're all buried in the ground, sometimes rather deep, and so I, I mean, if I would have seen this, I would have said it was an innkeeper worm, but I'd never call it that. I never call it by that name. Beard worms, that's easy to say. Um, long, thin worms, no digestive system, which is very uncommon in, in animals. So how do you think that they digest their food if they don't have a digestive system? How do they think they get nutrients? Now this is uh, three millimeters, this length. So this would be 
you know, three, six, nine. Okay, so this is kind of kind of long, long and thin for a little tiny like that. Um, arrow worms look like this. If you're holding one in your hand, they're almost clear, all marine, all planktonic, and all carnivorous. They eat other things. Remember, carnivore doesn't necessarily mean chump chump teeth, right? It just means that it eats another animal or zooplankton or something like that. All right, now we're moving on to a different phylum. I'm moving on from worms to something that's kind of in between a worm and a mollusk. And these are called lophophores or the lophophorates. They have a unique feeding structure called a lophophore. And um, that's these ciliated tentacles arranged in a horseshoe shape, like that, okay? Circular or coiled. And they are what's called suspension feeders. A suspension feeder, we're gonna see more of them later in these notes. Um, they wave something in the water and catch suspended particles, like the marine snow or zooplankton or phytoplankton or anything small enough that they can catch and, and pull in to their mouth with their tentacles, with their ciliated tentacles. Some of them are bryozoans. These, you, you've seen again, you've seen all of these creatures. If you've ever been to the water, if you've ever been to the beach, if you've ever been to a boat, if you've ever been to a dock, okay, down by the intercoastal, you've seen these. It's that fur, not real fur, but that furry coating that's on everything that grows in the water. The rocks, the pilings, the sides of bridges, underneath boats, unless your boat is constantly pulled out of the water, um, on floating docks, just they're everywhere. And, and they form these delicate colonies on all hard surfaces. The individuals are called zoids. Anything with zo is an animal, you know that. Um, and they, have, they, they can secrete skeletons. So you can see that they have their lophophores extended for feeding. Foronids, very similar. Um, they're worm-like, but not quite a worm. They build tubes of sand grains. So here's one with its um, feeding tentacles extended. They live in shallow water and mostly are very few centimeters long. And we're gonna talk about what some of these other things in here, this nerve cord, we're gonna talk about that coming up soon. At the end of, not the next set of notes, next set of notes. All right, lamp shells. Um, living in New York um, and having access to the mountains only a couple hours away. To get to the mountains here, you have to drive like 10 hours north, okay, to get to those northern Georgia, where you'd find fossils like these brachiopods, okay? These are called lamp shells. Um, they have been around since before walking animals on the planet, okay? They, so you can find them, like I was saying in New York, you can find them in the mountains, you, like, you know, the mountain that used to be down here as part of the ocean, but geological forces made that mountain go up, okay? There's fossils up there in those mountains. Fossils, sea fossils. And you can find these things everywhere. I used to go hunting for them when I was younger and found a bunch of them. I had them in my house, like, they're gone now. But anyway, um, they have a shell with two parts. One, two, and those parts are called valves. You may think a valve is something else, but just know that a valve is the shells, okay? And they attach to rocks and soft sediments in shallow water. And this is what they look like. They look like little clams or little oysters, but they're not. They're brachiopods. And this is the anatomy of one. See, it's very, complex with, um, this is the pedicle that they use to attach themselves. They have a muscle that keeps their, their, um, their valves closed, these muscles here. 
adductor muscles, they're called. So, but we won't get too deeply into that because um, that's not the creature that we're going to be drawing for our field guide. It's going to be something on this end of the spectrum, okay? In the mollusk phylum, phylum mollusca. Lots of species, all these numbers should have approximate signs in front of them. Um, both marine and fresh, there are freshwater mollusks. There aren't, aren't any freshwater octopuses, octopi, um, or squid, but there are snails and um, mussels and things like that. So they have a calcium carbonate shell, almost all of them, not these guys. <clears throat> um, and they're, once inside the shell, the valves, there is this tissue called a mantle that actually secretes the shell. It, it, and I'll show you a picture of that later. So <clears throat> just examples of different ones here. So um, here's the mantle. It's that tissue right there, just inside. And this is the, the body. Okay, so when you eat a clam, if you've ever eaten clams before, um, you usually just eat the muscular foot which is here. You don't typically eat the guts, although I've seen people growing up in the bay on Long Island, they just take the clam and they put it on the barbecue and then the heat makes the clam open up and obviously kills the clam and cooks the clam. And then they'll just open the rest of it up, put hot sauce on it and eat the whole thing. Like everything inside, so gross, okay. Mm. That's what you do with oysters. If you've ever eaten oysters before, it's the same thing. I'm going to teach you a little bit more about why eating that kind of stuff is raw like that. Raw. Cooked is fine, but raw, there are some problems. Okay. Um, and so this, again, this adductor muscle, these muscles have to be cut or somehow weakened in order for this organism to open. They're very strong. So they have bilateral symmetry. So right in half, okay? Not um, pent radial symmetry like a uh, sea star. They have gills for breathing and they have this muscular foot that pulls them into the ground. So just like you see here. So if you start this animation over, that's the siphons on that end. That's how they breathe and that's how they uh, eat. So you see the foot come out, finds its way, and it so it extends it and then it tightens it, which pulls the creature down inside the mud. And then it extends it again and tightens it. And it keeps doing that to um, get down into the substrate, which is the sand or mud that it lives in. <clears throat> And if you ever ate clam chowder, clam stew, clam fritters, clam casino, that's the chopped up pieces of the muscular foot's muscle. It's like, it's like cow muscle or pig muscle or chicken muscle or fish muscle, okay? All right, some, some mollusks have this, uh, have, a, have an anterior head, like a snail, okay, or slug. And, they, and on that head are this ribbon of teeth called a radula, and this is it. The radula is made out of chitin, which is very similar, which is the same material that a uh, crab's shell is made out of, hard, and um, it's very raspy. So I don't know if you know what a rasp is, but um, in woodworking, a rasp is a tool that you scrape wood shavings, well, not shavings, but you scrape wood off, okay? Anyway, so that's what these guys do. They use this radula as a scraping tool to, to scrape algae off of the bottom, you know, off of rocks or, or just food from the surface, okay? It's, a, it's like little, te little teeth to scrape. Not, now again, some mollusks, like snails and slugs. All right, so now we're gonna go down into the different classes of mollusks. So we're gonna start with the gastropods, the class gastropoda. Gastropod means stomach foot. Gastro, stomach, pod, foot. So these guys have their guts like right on their, their 
foot, okay? So there are snails, a cone snail. This is a keyhole limpet, a giant one. These are uh, nutmeg snails. They suck the blood of electric rays. Cooper's nutmeg, so they're parasitic. Pretty crazy how varied life is out there. Um, about 90,000 species. They use their radula, like I said before, and Again, some, are, some of them are carnivores, like carnivores, like the cone, the cone snail, we talked about that um, in a previous unit that has a harpoon with venom and it'll stab a fish and the fish will go limp and then the cone snail has its way with it. So very carnivorous. Here is a generalized structure. Uh, this is a, of a snail, gastropod. Um, you can see a lot of their body is up inside their shell that they uh, make. The mantle makes the shell. See, mantle. Okay. And some of them have both sexes, as you can see there. And there's the radula. Now, this, of course, would be a land snail because it has lungs. All right, so let's talk about some sea slugs, nudibranchs. These are actually very beautiful creatures. Um, one of them is actually called a Spanish dancer or something, a flamenco dancer, because it looks like a woman when it's moving, when it's swimming through the water, like undulating. It looks like the, the frills of a, um, a flamenco dancer, of, of the dress of a flamenco dancer. So um, they don't have a shell because they're slugs, right? They prey on sponges, hydroids, and other invertebrates. They're poisonous because they have retained noxious chemicals, particularly nematocysts, found in their prey. So when they are eating something that has stinging cells called nematocysts, they can use them in their own bodies, but particularly in the end of their um, Siri, or I'll show you what they're called in a minute. Okay. Serrata. Okay. Um, so you can see this is the slug, all right? And these serrata, they have pieces of the gut inside them, but at the end of them are the nematocysts from the prey that it eats. Somehow, evolutionarily it adapted to move the to, to eat the nematocysts without them hurting them and then they, they migrate up to the tips of these serrata which is part of the digestive system for protection against other predators eating them that's pretty wild now we're moving into class bivalvia, bivalve, two valves, all right, two shells, clams, mussels, oysters, and other types of those. They have a body that's laterally compressed, so flattened, and closed between those two shells, bivalve, okay? And here's just some different kinds, different uh, anatomical views of them with the foot and the muscles that um, you have to cut, they have a hinge, a ligament and a hinge at the back. Sometimes you can find them at the beach connected together still. These are muscles. So we're going to talk about the individuals here as well. They have gills right here. These frilly looking things are gills that all gills do. Collect oxygen from the water, but they also filter and sort small food particles. So they bring water in, it passes over the gills, which filter the food particles out, which it gets guided to their digestive system, and then the water gets out, goes out through another siphon, through another hole. We haven't defined the term siphon yet, but, um, but you've got X current and in current aperture. That just means an in hole and an out hole, okay? So what, they, what do they do? They filter the water. Well, what's in the water? Everything, right? Including toxins, bacteria, 
um, unicellular organisms that could be toxic to humans. So when you eat a shellfish, like a bivalve, oysters, clams, mussels, from water that is uh, sus, okay, um, you could get sick. I worked in a microbiology, marine microbiology laboratory in New York for a year and a half, and <clears throat> one of our jobs was to test the water where these organisms are fished commercially. I used to have a commercial fishing license as well for uh, clamming, for clamming license in New York. And um, if the bacteria levels were too high, we, ha we had the job of shutting down the fishing, the clamming industry until the bacteria levels lowered enough that was safe for human consumption. So that's, these guys filter the water. So here are clams. I used that foot we showed you earlier, or I showed you earlier. Um, again, there's an in-current siphon and ex-current siphon. They're both on the same side. In some organisms, they are a lot larger than in others, and they look very strange. Um, gills, mussels, so you're gonna be drawing something similar to this for this part of the unit. All right. Here is a bend-nosed clam with very long siphons. And these are, it's a tiny clam like on the beach that you can barely see, they're almost transparent. One in, one out. And you can see they can be deep in the substrate and the siphon can go all the way up out of the water. Out of the substrate, into the water, sorry. So they can breathe clearly. Here's a little more detail, all right? Now this is of a muscle. So the muscles, this is an open muscle. I showed you closed ones before. Muscles are very similar to clams, um, but they have these bissel threads right here. This is some of them right there. They're almost like spider webs for a bivalve. And they help secure the creature to rocks and other sub substrate. Um, like when waves are crashing in and hitting, it won't wash away the animal. The animal stays put. It glued itself to the rock, like, like a wet, like a spider web, you know? And it, these threads can come out, not that fast, but, and they're um, like glued, they glued on. And I have fished, collected mussels for bait before in New York, and you have to It'll actually make a tearing sound, like like you're ripping a piece of paper or something, um, when you when you pull them away from their substrate, when you break those bissel threads. Oysters, they now they don't use bissel threads, and they're not like clams that are free and free to move around. They cement themselves to a surface, and they make oyster beds. And we have oysters that grow all over the place here in Florida. Just go down to the intracoastal waterway um, and look on all, you know, lots of different hard surfaces and you'll see little clumps of oysters growing on the pilings and, and on rocks and things like that. And these are the only ones that make pearls, but they're also freshwater ones. Um, but those aren't expensive as the saltwater ones. When a piece of sand gets underneath the mantle. Remember, the mantle is just a layer of tissue that secretes the shell, right? And this is the shell, this is the, the mantle on top. If a piece of sand gets in between there, then the muscle will um, excrete or secrete the mother of pearl, which is what the shell is made up out of, except it'll do it in a layers over that sand to prevent it from irritating the, the animal. Okay, imagine you had a piece of sand like under your tongue and it was like, you ever get a piece of food like deep under your tongue and you're like, ah, oh, I can't get it out. Um, and it it's tickles or it actually hurts, it's scratchy. Imagine that you could secrete like something over it to make it soft. And that's pretty much what they do. And, and again, it's just mother of pearl. It's just layers of, shiny layers of calcium carbonate. Just the stuff that any shell is made out of. Scallops. Scallops are the only ones that can swim using jet propulsion. These are 
Very interesting. And these are the only ones that have eyes or types of eyes, you know, not like our eyes. But um, so these are obviously a, a little higher up on the, uh, on the chain, okay, of taxonomic um, complexity, all right? So if, if you try to catch a certain scallops, certain species of scallops, they will do that. They'll try to they'll swim away. Like if a sea star is coming and the scallop's like, oh, and it senses it with its light, you know, sensing eyes, it'll say, nope, and it'll do that. So that's pretty crazy. This is a close-up of the eyes at the sun and nose. That's just the uh, pieces of the mantle, okay? And these are two of the eyes that look like eyes, but... Now I have some inside story about this. I always have inside stories, so we'll get to that in a moment. So here's a scallop's eye. Okay, they have pigmentation, like you saw on that last slide. Um, these ones are blue, okay, red. Um, they have a cornea with a lens behind it, just like human more advanced eyes. A retina with rods, just like we have. Pigmented and reflecting membranes and an optic nerve. They don't have, uh, that, goes, that goes to their, um, you know, to be able to sense things on the outside. Now, we don't know exactly how it works. It seems similar to um, a human eye. Uh, you know, some, some experts say that it just responds to light and moving objects, but it seems a little more complex than that. It seems like they can actually see, you know, uh, uh, objects, okay? All right, so. In 2004, I, that's me, ventured out on this vessel, the Albatross 4, a NOAA, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration uh, program called the Teacher at Sea program. And so that's, that's me there again and me there again on the ship for 17 days out at sea. And we did something called a sea scallop survey. Now, why? Why did we do this? There were no vessels go out all the time. Research vessels go out all over the world, um, from, from Hawaii and, and from the Gulf of Mexico, and from I left from Woods Hole, Massachusetts, in New England. Um, and they work for the fishing industry. Well, they don't work for the fishing industry. They regulate the fishing industry. The government agency that actually is a branch of the military um, that goes out and, in part, among many other scientific things they do, they regulate the fishing industry. So they say they count organisms here, sharks there, all different or, you know, organisms, and they determine how healthy the fishing industry is. And they, just like I did before in that marine microbiology lab I worked in, they will shut down certain areas or certain species of fishing until the numbers come back. So they help regulate um, our resources, all right? And, and this was a sea scallop survey mission. So I went out with the as a scientist with other scientists who worked for NOAA um, and officers who ran the ship, and we studied sea scallops and collected them from the bottom. That's where I got that rock from in the back of the room. And that's where those, those scallops there, those five scallop shells came from this trip. You can see two of them are, if you look back there, some of you aren't looking, look right back there on that shelf. Um, two of them are dark colored. Those are fossils. Those are fossilized sea scallop shells. But the other ones, the lighter colored ones are, um, are ones from living ones that we got. And in some of them you could see boring sponges have atta had attached themselves to the, to the shell and started to make holes in them. So we learned about boring sponges in the previous uh, slide uh, show. And that rock on top is where I got, I, uh, this is where I got that rock from too, from the bottom of the ocean. So um, one of the things we studied was sea scallop sex. So every time we collected um, certain organisms, we had to dissect them and um, co collect the information about them. So one of the things we had to do for every one that we collected, we collect bushels and bushels of scallops. We actually ate a lot of scallops. We took scallops home with us. It was crazy. We had a lot. Of, it was fun. But, um, and very, 
enlightening as well. So we, I learned that the males, uh, so the females have red gonads and the males have white gonad tissue. So that was one way we were able to sex the sea scallops. We were able to tell the difference between them. Um, um, I, we also observed symbiosis in sea scallops. These little tiny fish, is that little tiny fish right there upside down? Um, when, when, you cut, when you cut the scallop, you can see the eyes all along the fr fringe. This is the mantle. Um, this is the gonad tissue and the stomach. And the, this is the muscle. This is the part you eat right here of, the, of scallops. And many of you have eaten scallop before. That's the part right there. That keeps the clam closed, uh, the, the scalp closed, but it also can, you know, swim like this. Anyway, this little fish lives out its entire life. It's called a Lipirus fish in the existence of this, the mantles for protection of, you know, of the, the valves for protection. And this is a zoomed in picture of that little fish. It's called a Lipirus fish. It doesn't, doesn't hurt the scallop, but it uses the scallop. So what kind of symbiosis is that? Is it mutualism? Does the fish do anything? No. Is it parasitism? Is the fish eating the scallop? No. So it must be um, commensalism, right? Okay, here's another one. This is a red hake fish. So the red hake will spend its juvenile, its young year or young life in the valves. And um, when it gets big, it will leave. It can't stay in there anymore. And that's the muscle. So this is everything else pulled out except this fish that we found in there and the muscle. It lives in there. It's a little home. Again, that's commensal commensalism. All right, so moving on from scallops, moving on to shipworms. They're not worms at all. They, they look like they might be a worm because they tunnel through wood. They tunnel through, you, you probably have seen it, and you, again, you probably didn't know what did it, but wood, driftwood, washed up on the shore, and you see it has a whole bunch of holes in it like that. And that's because this mollusk that has this long body uses its shell, its valves to cut the wood and, and it makes a tunnel, okay? And so you'll also find them in mangrove roots, uh, pilings, things like that. This is what the creature looks like. That's, just, that's the shell and the long body. It's really strange creatures. They call them shipworms, but they're not worms. They are mollusks. Now we're moving on to a different class called class cephalopoda or the cephalopods. Cephalopod means head foot. So this is how their, this, these organisms have their feet pretty much coming out of their head, okay? Um, you've seen uh, Pirates of the Caribbean with uh, Davy Jones, the squid-headed, you know, the octopus head-looking guy. So anyway, with the tentacles right here, right? Okay. Um, these are predators. They're special, they have special locomotive adaptations. Um, they include the octopuses, the squids, the cuttlefish, and the nautilus. There are about 650 species, all the marine. There are no freshwater species that we know of. Perhaps maybe millions and millions and millions of years ago there were, but not anymore. These are some ancient ones. They've been around for a very long time. Um, these don't exist anymore. These are all uh, 425 million year old fossils of, of uh, cephalopods. That, so they've been, these, these have been around, this class of of mollusk has been around for a very long time. They have a head, again with arms, suckers. Some squid don't just have suckers, like this giant Pacific octopus here. Um, they have hooks on their suckers as well. Eek. They have eyes that are very similar to humans. Now we're getting up into that more advanced um, you know, uh, anatomy. So. Just, just is very comparable to a human's eye, and you can see a little baby octopus looking out of a can there. Um, they have very similar eyes, most advanced of, of, of all the mollusks. They have two or four gills, 
depending upon the species, and that water exits through a funnel, and they use the funnel for jet propulsion, and you can see the water passing through. So the water comes in through the mantle. This is their mantle back here. This is called, this is the mantle. So they have a mantle just like a clam, but it's outside no shell. So this is this, the head of an octopus is the mantle, and then the water's coming in there and coming out through the, um, the funnel, okay? A mating in these creatures requires a special, uh, it's like a packet of sperm. They almost like they deposit it in there using a, 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 a weird arm, okay? A special arm called a hectocotylus that they use just the, the, the male, just they don't have a penis, in other words. So they use their arm to take their sperm and they put it into the female, just like that, okay? Um, and this is a, a Pacific blue ringed octopus. They are toxic, a toxic, its bite is venomous and it will kill you. They live in the Pacific Ocean, the Great Barrier Reef, places like that. So octopus, now we're talking about just octopi. They don't have a shell, we know that. They have eight arms, hence the name octopus, right? They're benthic, what does that mean? Benthic means they live on the bottom. They don't typically swim around in the water column or at the surface. Um, they live on the bottom, always. And they range from five centimeters, like, like tiny, of the baby, um, to nine meters. That's nine meter sticks. That's from here to the back corner of the room. I mean, giant Pacific octopus, okay? Like this guy here. Those suckers are the size of plates. Huge. They're predators, we know this. They eat crabs, lobsters, shrimp. Um, they have beak-like jaws. And some of them, like the blue-ringed octopus, have a highly toxic bite. Here is an octopus bite marks on a leg of a crab. They love crabs, they love shellfish. Um, here's their beak, or a beak of one. Just a chitinous beak. They make shelter in rocks, and they emit a dark fluid from an ink sac. So here's an ink sac up inside their mantle, and they shoot it out of the funnel, or which is a siphon, and you can see it. This one's trying to confuse it, a predator by clouding the water with ink. So, true story. And they used to, and people still do, collect ink to use for writing. They still do. Octopus or squid ink. So moving on from the octopi to the squids. They are adapted to swim fast. They have 10 arms with suckers that circle the mouth. Cephalopod. Two of them are feeding tentacles. And they have these things in the end, they call them clubs, and they can be shot out to catch prey. Just like, like, a, like a frog or a chameleon tongue. They shoot out and um, they'll, they'll wrap themselves around or even the little hooks will hook onto a fish or something and they'll pull it into their mouth and bite it with that sharp, bitey beak. I know when we used to cook these in a restaurant when I was a, a dishwasher in New York in my first job, um, one of the things we had, to, we had to make sure that we pulled that muscular mouth beak out because if that hit the hot oil, it would pop and spatter oil everywhere. They have a supportive flimsy shell squid called a pen. And this is what a pen looks like. This is like if you were to get a squid from the fishing market or you know the grocery store and you had to clean it yourself, you have to pull that pen shell out that gives them a little bit of, gives their mantle a little bit of support so it's not so flimsy. It's clear, it looks like clear plastic, it looks fake, but that's their, that's their shell. They, so like, like I said, they range from a few centimeters to 20 meters. Um, the squid, octopus were nine meters, squid are bigger. The arc, Archituthis, this is one that was brought up from uh, deep sea, so it's being um, dissected and studied, okay? You see how big it is compared to a human hand there. And this is video that recently came out, first video ever 
of an Archituthis that came up closer. I think actually a fishing vessel caught one in a net and pulled it up, but they didn't pull it into the boat. And they got this video, they dropped the camera in really quick, and they got this video of one um, near the surface, relatively near the surface, in Japan, Japanese fishermen. And this is an artistic rendition of an Archituthis being eaten by a sperm whale. Sperm whales will travel down a mile into the water to find these favorite foods. And we know that they eat them. We've never gotten video of it. We know that they eat them because we find their squid beaks in their stomachs. When this whale, when a whale dies and we wash it up on the shore, for example, when it's dissected, they will find squid beaks, and this is a squid beak of an Archituthis, um, in their stomach. Undigestible, it's chitin. And then there are some other strange squid, like this big fin squid. Um, they don't have a funnel to jet propulsion. They don't need it. They just use their these long tentacles and their wing-like fins on the side of their mantle to locomote around. Locomote? Is that a word? Locomote? Locomate? To move. There you go. Okay. And finally, we're going to talk about the cuttlefish. The cuttlefish is an amazing adaptive, adaptive creature. It has color-changing chromatophores in its skin, and this is, this is it getting ready to, to hunt. This is, this is its hunting color. It, it, it'll pulsate with color, but it also can look just like it could blend into the rocks. It could, look, it could change the, even the texture of it. Check this out. The texture is spiky, but then the spikes go back in and it becomes smooth. It's getting ready to attack a, uh, a crab in, in, in this thing, in this animation. And then inside their mantle, they have a much stronger uh, internal shell called a cuddle bone. And you may have seen these if you ever owned a bird in a cage, a pet bird. Um, because you'll put these in the side of the cage and the birds will peck at this to get um, calcium for their diet, okay? And that is our notes for part five. Oh wait, ha, huh. tricked ya, one more. I promise this is the last one. Um, slide 53, the chambered Nautilus. This is a very ancient creature, been around for a very long time. What's unique about this guy is they have chambers filled with gas they use for buoyancy um, inside their shell. And you can see the cutaway of the chambered nautilus there. And their tentacles are numerous. They have between 60 and 90 short, suckerless arms used to capture prey. So that is the chambered nautilus.